of times when I speak, I kind of have a little bit of an intro and get everybody kind of together and ready and like, come on, isn't this going to be great? I feel a bit like I'm on holy ground this morning. And I mean that with all of my heart. I was sitting down there. I'm like, God, you know, somebody asked me, I don't know, I was speaking somewhere a couple of months ago and they said, you get nervous when you speak. And I said, you know, the thing that makes me nervous is God, I don't want to get in your way. And I genuinely mean that with all of my heart. That makes me more nervous than anything else. I'm like, God, please, don't let me get in your way. And I can feel it so strong in my spirit this morning. God wants to do something in our lives. I said to Lisa, who works with me, I said to her this morning, when, during worship, I said, God is stitching us up for breakthrough this morning. And I feel that. I, I don't say that to get us excited, which is why I'm saying it in a kind of more of a lower tone, because I don't want to just get us excited, but I want to speak into the atmosphere what God is doing. He is stitching us up for breakthrough. When you look at the prayer, when you look at the amazing worship, and we look at what Tim has said, I can just see the weaving of heaven coming through this, and he is stitching us up for something. For some people, it's something you have been longing for for a very long time. It's something you've been crying out for. It's something that you've been asking God for and you feel like you've been pushing and pushing and you're right at this edge and you just you can't quite get there I am in faith this morning that something is going to break in this atmosphere there's a breakthrough atmosphere here this morning and some people are going to step over into something that you have been longing for for a very very long time Again, during worship, I remembered, I'm not going to preach on it, but the Lord brought back to my mind the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And I don't want to take much time talking about it because there's something else I want to talk about. But there was a man for 38 years sat near this pool. And if you'd step into the pool, you would get healed. And for 38 years, he sat by the pool and he never got into the waters. But there was one day. There was one moment with Jesus. Because it always comes back to Jesus. Just Jesus. One moment. And Jesus walked up to him. And he simply said, do you want to get well? Do you want this? And I felt like the Lord said that. For all of us. Do you want? Want this or not? What do you want? We have more, what's the right word, choice than we realize. We have more power in the right way than we realize. Do you want this? All we have to do is say yes. Someone today just needs to say, Jesus, yes. That's it. Yes, that will be your breakthrough moment. Do you want it? Jesus didn't come from a place of pity. I'm so sorry you've been there all these years. Gosh, uh, tell me about it. Not that that's wrong, but that's not what he did because he knew that's not what he needed. And I believe this morning that's not what we need. What we need is do you want it? And what did he say to the man? Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. That mat was very familiar to him. He had said, that was his identity. I can't move off my mat. Somebody today is going to move off your mat. Because he's saying to you, get up. Pick up that old identity that's been holding you down for years. And walk into who I've created you to be. You see, when it comes from Jesus, it's never with this anger or force or come on, just do it. That's never the heart of God. The heart of God is I want you free. I just want you free. That's why I'm being a little bit pushy because I want you free. What do we do when a child learns to walk? We're like, come on. And they fall down. We're like, come on, baby, come on. Because 
because you know that's going to set them free into their next season of growth. We're in a season of growth right now, and he's wanting to set us free into the next season of growth. So we say, do you want it? You can sit there, and you can leave the same, or you can decide, I refuse to stay where I've been because I want to go where God's created me to go. Oh, I feel better. Okay. I'm going to skip any of the intro I was going to say because, again, there's so much that God has. The title of the message is A New Normal. God's bringing us into a new normal. And if you're going to come into a new season, you have to prepare for that season. Last week, we heard the wonderful news about Aishka and her husband. What's his name? Pete. Aishka and Pete. Sorry, Pete, if you're here. Aishka and Pete, who are pregnant. Well, she is. All right. (laughs) And going to have a baby. Now, how weird would it be? We've just heard this great news. How strange would it be if for the next several months, nothing changed in their lives? They just carried on as normal. Until she pops the baby out. Because, you know, that's how it works. She pops the baby out. And they arrive home. And then she goes, oh, I think we need a nappy. Oh, oh, should we get maybe a Moses basket? Do we have any blanket? Oh, ah. And then they start thinking about what they need. Bad parenting, okay? That's ridiculous. You would never do that because you know that something is coming. Guys, we know something's coming. In the spirit, we know something is coming. Paul, who preached brilliantly last week, alluded to that. We know the body of Christ is moving towards something. God is on the move. He is stirring the waters. There is something coming in a new season that is unlike any season that we have had before. It looks different than what we have had before. So why would we not prepare differently than before? And that's... Really the heart of what I want to get to this morning that I feel God has put on my, on my heart. I've preached various places, but this is a brand new message, right? You're, you're getting the dry run, right? I've not given this anywhere. And the Lord a couple of months ago put it on my heart. He said, that's for BCC. So it's slightly unnerving because it's always nice to have practice somewhere, but you're my practice run, Because I've been preaching for months and months on Joshua and the Red Sea and New Season and Promised Land, all sorts. And he said, no, 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 no. We're going to talk about Joseph this morning. But before I get there, I want to remind us of something. Because when you know that change is coming, I don't know about you, but what I tend to do is kind of like want to just hold on (laughs) to something familiar. I love change. You know, I'm a girl who loves change. I'm like, yeah, bring it on, bring it on. But I also like a little bit of the familiar. So I want to remind us at the beginning of a scripture And it's found in Psalm 105, verse 8, in the Passion Translation. And it says this, For though a thousand generations may pass away, he is still true to his word. You see, there are some things that never change. And as we move toward change, as we move toward breakthrough, as we think of leaving something behind that has been familiar, it helps to know there are some things that never change. The word of God does not change. Jesus does not change. His nature does not change. His love does not change. His goodness does not change. I will rest in that place and allow that to carry me into the new season. I wrote this on a Facebook post a couple of days ago. A passage of time does not threaten God's sovereignty. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at delay and I think, God, really? Have you forgotten me? I know what your word says, but I know what I feel. A passage of time does not threaten God's sovereignty. He is sovereign. When it goes longer than expected, he is still sovereign. When there seems to be no more options, he is still sovereign. When you cannot understand why nothing is happening, he is still sovereign. That does not change. His sovereignty is not based on and does not fluctuate with his ability to meet my deadline. 
God is still good. And when you have goodness and you have sovereignty, then you meet miracles. God's goodness, God's sovereignty creates miracles. But we have to know the season that we are in. I can't force him into my season and my breakthrough. He is still God. That will never change his sovereignty, but his sovereignty is always filled with his goodness. And for me to say, God, you need to do this now, would be the same as me, even in the natural, a season in the natural. Imagine in the middle of winter, here, at least in this country, in the middle of winter, getting really annoyed with God that it's not 25 degrees on Christmas. Come on, Lord. I prayed. I asked you. I declared. I stood. Why is it not 25 degrees today? You're in the wrong season, sweetheart. It's not the season for heat. It's the season for rain and cloud and blustery weather. In for Christmas, okay? It's the wrong season. And we have to discern and understand our seasons to work with God. Now, God can do miracles. We love the miracles, but I am not going to base my life on just hoping for another miracle. I want to learn the season of God. I want to learn how God works. I want to learn and listen to what he is saying so I can partner with him to see the breakthrough that I know he wants to give me because he is good and he is sovereign and he's a miraculous working God. Does that make sense? Okay, so what season are we in? He's bringing us into a new normal. But to go into the new normal, you must leave the old familiar. And that takes maturity. We are in a season of grow. No, grow, go. You know when children are growing and maturing because they make different choices. It's the same thing spiritually. Now, I'm going to get to some scripture in a minute, but I want to share that there's something I went through recently that um, I did not think I would ever go through. And when I've started to talk to some people about this, it's interesting because you have different people. Some people are interested and some are a bit like, don't want to know. Do not want to know. Because what I went through was a detox to get healthy. See, already I can feel in the atmosphere. Check your phone, check your phone. What's happening on Facebook? Okay, check it out for a minute. Don't check out, okay? Because the Lord convicted me. He's like, are you stewarding yourself physically as well as spiritually, as well as emotionally, as well as mentally? Lord, come on, I like my coffee. Now I'm really getting in your business only 15 minutes in, aren't I? And so I felt led to do this detox. Now, I've never, has anybody ever done a detox? Oh, look at you, healthy bunch. All right, okay. So I did this detox, and I'll be honest, I thought, let me get through it. I'm just, you know, we'll see how this goes, and then let me get back to normal life. Let me get back to my familiar. Okay, well, I've done the detox. Honestly, I have felt so good, have more energy, skin looks amazing. I'm like, God, this is incredible. And then I had a problem. Because I can't live the way that I did and still have this. That's the annoying bit, isn't it? When God takes us into a new season, we still want the old familiar. Same thing when you become a Christian. I don't know about you. I didn't become a Christian until I was 19. I'm not going to go through that story. But I was interested in it, but I also wanted my old familiar. I want both. Well, it doesn't work that way. But the thing is, you have to experience this to know you don't want that. Faith makes that step. And so this detox, honestly, God has been speaking to me about so many spiritual principles through this, and I'm not going to go through it. But I had this real dilemma this past week because I finished the 30 days, and it was brilliant, great, most of it. Brilliant, great, okay, really glad I did it. And now I thought, I'm free. I can have a coffee because we live in freedom, right? Everything's permissible. Not everything's beneficial, but everything's permissible, Lord. So I can have a coffee. So I was all excited about my coffee. And so Lisa, again, she works with me. I got her to do the detox. Bless her heart. Pray for Lisa. <laughs> so anyway, we're doing this detox together. So we're like, all right, yay, coffee day. So we're going down, of course, the Forum Cafe. We're going to get our coffee. And Joel, I don't know if Joel's here. Joel, I can't say his surname. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Joel made this amazing coffee. It was brilliant. And I'm like, oh, yes, coffee. Thank you, Jesus. For about 12 and a half minutes, 
And then suddenly it happened. And I was like, ah, oh, my head. Oh, I just have this like dull, headachy, sluggish. And I thought, oh, Jesus, no. Oh, Jesus, no. I'm being totally honest. I really was like, no, please, God, no, please, please. I really want my coffee. I'll be at the altar. So I'm like, oh, I need one. I thought, oh, no. So then the next day, I talked to my mom that night. She said, maybe get a decaf. So, oh, yeah. Okay, so the next day, I got the decaf, right? And still this, not the headache, but a bit of a sluggish thing. And so now I've got a choice to make. What do you want? What do you want? <laughs> do you want to feel healthy and alive and alert? Or do you want your coffee? So I've done research, and I'm trying desperately to find one that doesn't make you feel that way. <laughs> right? I might have found something. I'll let you know. I'll keep you updated. I've never fought so hard for an addiction in my life, okay? Because you just, there's something about the familiar. You're like, I just want to hold on to, please, God, let me have my coffee and have my freedom at the same time. Okay, it's a ridiculous thing, but spiritually, it's the same thing. Do you want the new season, church? We say we do. We proclaim we do. We want to see Bath change. We want to revive. We want to move of God. We want the altars filled. We want to see the balcony filled. We want to see people healed, set free, and delivered. That's great. Are you willing to leave something in the old familiar? Because you won't have this and that at the same time. God's maturing us into a new season. You okay with me? Is that right? Okay. So let's talk about, oh, before I do that, I just want to put a picture up. Very, very quickly, there's a picture of a door that I sent. I don't know, I felt this was for someone. We're just, we're not going to camp on this, but we're going to put that up there. That is, we are at that place. Okay, we're at that place. That door has been open for a long time. I'm talking spiritually, it's been shut, it's been shut, it's been shut. Something has opened. We are on this side of the door. We have not yet stepped through. But I'll tell you what, we are so unbelievably close. And the new season is right on that other side. And I believe right now, it's like you're at that door, you're about to go in, and the Lord is saying, what are you going to leave? What are you going to leave? I felt in my spirit, it was almost like he's holding people back. And some people are really frustrated because you're thinking, God, why haven't you changed this situation? What needs to be put here? So you're ready to go there. The key verse for today is Psalm 105, verse 19. I saw this, I don't know, a month or so ago. And I asked, actually, yeah, I asked them to put it up. It's not super clear. Sorry about that. But this is what I put on my Facebook page. Because I liked the bars on the window. Because I think some of us feel like we're in that place right now. God's promise to Joseph purged his character until it was time for his dreams to come true. Keep that up there for a few minutes, actually. Just keep that up there while I'm talking about Joseph. God's promise to Joseph purged his character until it was time for his dreams to come true. Now, I want to very briefly give a Jen Baker version of who Joseph is because I don't want to go on an assumption that absolutely everybody in the room, that might be your first time, you might not have any idea about this whole church thing. And so we're going to do a very one and a half minute or one minute recap of Joseph, because there's a lot about this guy. You might have heard he had a coat of many colors. So he was about 17. He was favored by his father. His brothers weren't too keen on that fact. He has a dream. His brothers and his family are going to bow down to him. He thought it'd be a great idea to share the dream. So he shares the dream with his family. They weren't so keen on it, especially the brothers were not particularly keen on thinking that they're going to bow down to their brother. And so one day they were all out and they were out in the middle of kind of somewhat nowhere because I don't know where it is. We're going to call it nowhere. He was out in the middle of nowhere and the brothers thought, here is a perfect opportunity to get rid of this guy because I refuse to bow down to him. And so they threw him into a well. A few wanted to kill him. There's another one that thought maybe that's not a good idea. Basically, they threw him into this pit, into this well. A caravan happened to be going by at that exact moment. And the caravan just happened to have money and just happened to want a slave. So they just happened to pay the brothers a bit of money. And then they took Joseph as a slave. This man who had a dream at the beginning, now has gone into a place of slavery. And so now they brought him into Potiphar's house. So he's serving Potiphar in Potiphar's house. And God's favoring him in that place. And then Potiphar's wife thinks, hello. 
And so Potiphar's wife kind of, you know, suggests a few things. And because he's a man of God and of integrity, he runs. He does not walk, guys. He runs away from that situation. And he runs out the door. And because she's embarrassed and ashamed of the whole thing and feeling a bit rejected, she says to her husband, hey, he tried to rape me. The husband doesn't do any kind of investigation. He just throws him into a place of prison. So now he's in prison. Things have gone from bad to worse because of something that he didn't do except have a dream. And so now he's here in prison. God, what is going on? But he's serving God and he's faithful. And in prison, while he's there, he's overseeing some guys. And there's a couple of guys that have a dream. And they're confused and they think, I don't know what this dream means. And Joseph's like, hey, I've got a connection with God. Let me ask him and I'll tell you. And so he does. And to one, he says, good news, you're going to live. To the other, he says, you're going to die. And that's what happens. The one lives and then the one dies. And the one who lives, he says, mate, don't forget me, please. Don't forget me in this place. And the guy says, oh, yeah, no problem. Got you back. I'll remember you. He forgets him. And so then two years goes by and he's still over here in prison. And then at that time, then you've got um, Pharaoh, who's the overseer of Egypt, has a dream. And he's freaking out because he doesn't know what his dream means and then this guy says hey i knew this guy a couple oh yeah i forgot oh yeah there's some guy in prison that might be able to help you so they go back and they get him from prison and he interprets the dream and pharaoh says you're amazing i'm gonna make you number two of the whole kingdom and then what happens is there's a huge famine and so all the brothers in the family over here are starving and they say hey there's some guy over there in egypt because they don't know it's him some guy over in egypt let's go talk to him so they talk to him and bow down and the dream comes true. But Joseph was a very different man. And that's the journey God is taking us on. I'm not going to look at promise because we love promise and we all have promises. You know your promise that God has. You know what you're holding on for. You know what the word of God says. But notice what comes after promise, purging. And after a place of purging, you have until. And this was the word. This was what told me. I felt like God said, speak it this morning here. People are at until. We're going to get to until in just a minute. There is an until moment. Dreams come true. But I want us to take a minute to look at the purging. Now, I came up with a really cheesy phrase. Can I share a really cheesy phrase? Just humor me. Okay. The surge is in the purge. Turn to your neighbor and say, the surge is in the purge. Now, you think it's cheesy? You think it is cheesy, right? If you want to surge forward to your next season, then it's in the purging. But then I looked up the word surge. I thought the Lord is actually in this cheesy phrase because I looked up this word surge. You all know what surge means in the dictionary. No lie. A sudden, powerful forward or upward movement, especially by a crowd or a tidal or a natural force like a tide. What are we believing for in this next season? I'm believing for a surge of the Holy Spirit. I'm believing for a surge of the prophetic. I'm believing for a surge of the miraculous. I'm believing for a surge of breakthrough. I'm believing for a surge of salvations. I'm believing for a surge. I don't want a little bit. I want a surge to come in this place. But if there's going to be a surge, we have got to be ready to be purged. Because you can't get there if you don't go through this. So I could get you even more excited about the surge, but we're going to talk about the purge. Because I've learned in my own life, I need to love the purge more than I want the surge. It's a hard word to preach, and it's an even harder word to live. But that's part of the reason I wrote the book. It doesn't, I'm not saying it's easy for me. I'm not on some pedestal here. It's just as hard, but it's a decision. I am going to see Jesus in the middle of this purge because I want to represent him when it comes to the time of surge. I have got to leave an old familiar if I want to move into a new normal. So what does the Lord need to purge? 
I love, that's why I loved what Janine said about the prayer meeting this morning. It's called a holiness. It's called a holiness. One of the verses, I don't know if I'll get it from memory, one of the verses that the Lord put in my heart at the beginning of the year was in Joshua. I think it's 3 5, might be wrong. But it says, Consecrate me, O Lord, for tomorrow you will do amazing things. Consecrate me, Lord. Lord, purge. I want your holiness, God. I want your presence more than I want my breakthrough. You guys, when we can get to that point, and it is possible. When we can get to the point where we say, Lord, I want you to get rid of everything. I lay it all down and enjoy the presence of God in that place. Then we're ready because then we don't care so much about the dream coming true. And I'll explain why in a minute. And as I was prepping for this, it was like the Lord gave me a picture of us on an operating table. Imagine you're on an operating table and the surgeon is there and he's doing surgery. Now I realize this obviously wouldn't happen, but what I saw was like if you're laying on that table and he's doing surgery, if you were to wake up and say, no, 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 I don't like the cut there. I'd prefer you to cut over there. No, 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 don't work on that bit. I want you to work on that bit. Oh, just leave that. I'm sure it will be fine. How ludicrous would that be? I just, as I'm seeing this, it made me laugh because I just saw the surgeon who clearly is God just put his hand over my mouth. (laughs) Shut up and let me work. And with the greatest kindness in my heart, am I allowed to say shut up at Bass City Church? Maybe we just need to be quiet and let God work. Let him work. He studied really hard for this. He really does know what he's doing. And he probably knows if he's making a cut there, there's a reason for that. The best thing we can do is just lay still. And you know what? I haven't been, had surgery for years, but when you're under, you, you don't, you're not aware of what's going on. You just kind of lay there. Let's just lay in the presence of God and say, Lord, have your way. Have your way. You know, I just had something go through my spirit that there's somebody here that You're coming in with a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of baggage, a whole lot of things from the past, a whole lot of, there's just stuff you've done, you've been involved with, just stuff that you're carrying. That's the best way I can describe it. Just this heavy that you're carrying. And I really believe that this morning, it isn't going to be a very, very long, 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 long journey. The Lord's going to take a whole lot of that off in a very short amount of time. Allow the presence. I just see his presence just hitting you. Just hitting you. And Father, I pray for that one. Even right now, whoever that is, that even now, Holy Spirit, you would begin. Your presence would just begin. Gently. To begin. To come over them. Bring them into a place of stillness. A place of stillness. Because in that place of stillness, God does his best work. And he wants to purge so just a few things. Just a few things. He's wanting to get out this morning. So stay in that place. Don't rush off of that place. Don't rush out of that place. Just know it's only for your good. You know, the Israelites... This was after Joseph, and again, we're not going to go into it, but many of you know the Israelites were in slavery for several hundred years, 400 years they were in slavery, and then Moses came, and Moses set them free, and, and they came through the Red Sea and all of that. But there's one verse that I love that happened right before they left. And this is a verse in Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, and it says this, The Lord had given the people, the Israelites, had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. The Egyptians, the enemy, let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. You see, you go through the purge, and then there's a plunder, so that you have your provision for your next season. That's part of the purging. And I'll tell you what, I have been through, and there's no time to go into it, but I have been through some very 
It's been the worst three to four or five years of my life, um, certainly before coming here. I wouldn't say the last year has been, but before coming here. Very difficult things, and I know that there's many people, and you would say the same, my goodness, three to four years it is one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. And I made a decision at the beginning of that. I remember when I knew, sometimes you know, this is going to be a long, this is going to be a long journey. You get the diagnosis. You just have that sudden, this is going to be a long journey. And I made a decision at the beginning. And I said, Lord, we are plundering the enemy for this one. I am plundering the enemy. I will go through the purging. I will go through what you're asking. I will follow the road that you have, but I will not allow myself to get into self-pity. I will not allow myself to ask why. I will not allow myself to camp in that place. I'm going to plunder the enemy because I know that my God is good. I know that my God is bringing me somewhere. I know that there are dreams coming true. I know this is the process that we go on. And so in order to do that, I am going to get breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough because breakthrough plunders the enemy and it plunders the enemy to give you something that you carry into the next season to help somebody else get free. That is where we're going. So that is why we have got to plunder the enemy. And the way you plunder the enemy is you say, Lord, purge me. Purge me. Because I want to plunder him. He doesn't have the last word. God does. He doesn't tell me how this ends. God does. He doesn't tell me my future. God does. So don't you dare speak to me. I get really, I get forceful with the enemy. I love people. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, I get fierce with the enemy because he ruled my life for too many years, even as a Christian. Too much fear, too much insecurity, too much hatred, too much, God, just so much self-pity. Too much stuff was over me. And to break out of that and to see what I had been stuck in, I'm like, you are so going to pay for this. And so I said, God, you take me wherever you want to take me. You give me people to talk to. I'm going to lay hands on whatever moves because I want to see him plundered and pay for what he did in this next season. Come on, that is why we go through the purging. That is why I want to get the big picture here because it's too easy. This is difficult, honey. I know it is. And I'm not dismissing how painful it is. Please hear my heart. I'm not. But I refuse to focus on that when I've got Jesus sitting on the throne who's already won the victory. So that is the plunging. All right. I want to read a couple of scriptures Yes. Yes. You with me? We okay? Great. Genesis chapter 39. I'm going to start in verse 5. Even though I've given you the story, I love the word of God, and actually seeing the word of God brings breakthrough. So I don't want to just tell it to you. I want us to read it. Genesis 39. This is where Joseph now is serving Potiphar. And it says, from the time that he, meaning Potiphar, made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, because of Joseph, he had no concern about anything except the food that he ate. Now, I have read that verse I don't know how many times. Maybe you've seen this before. I have never seen that. Don't you love it when that happens, when you read a verse and you're like, I've never seen that before. I was reading this verse I have never seen before. Look at that last verse. So he, again, this is Potiphar. So this guy left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. He could have cared less about his kingdom. He didn't care about what was happening, ruling around the kingdom or his house or anything in his house. He just wanted to know what was for dinner. I thought, he's only concerned about his food? (laughs) Anyway, I'll do it, Dan. Okay. Genesis chapter 39. Actually, no, let me say this very quickly. Notice how his life at that moment looked exactly opposite his dream and his promise. So crucial. And you know what? Some of us, we know this, but we need to be reminded. Because we have this promise, we have this dream, we've got the word, we know what it says. And then suddenly, everything looks the opposite. What do we do 
in that moment. Joseph served. Josh did a brilliant preach a couple weeks ago about serving. He served. He didn't get in self-pity. He didn't get in that place. Now, I don't know for sure. He might have had moments. We don't know. But he served. This looks different than I thought. I'm going to serve you in this place, Lord. And I'm going to keep worshiping you. That's the best thing that we can do. The best thing we can do. I say to people all the time, please, I almost beg people, when stuff is coming against you, the best thing you can do is push in to Jesus. Press in, don't pull away. Push forward, don't pull back. Worship, don't ask why. That will lead you to your breakthrough. But we have a choice. What do you want? What do you want? Genesis chapter 39, he's now been thrown into prison. It says in verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. See, the Lord's not left him. He's not left him and he's not left you. Showed him steadfast love and favor in the sight of the keeper of prison. The keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Now, at this point from our timeline, over here, you've got promise, and then you've got the purging, and then you've got until, and then you've got dreams coming, um, coming true. I believe that verse is about right here. You're right before the until. You're right at that door that is just open. He was standing in this place, and in this place, nothing was changing. Nothing changed. It had gone from bad to worse, and now he was just... Kind of like circling, you know, like airplanes do. They're just in this holding pattern. Who feels, you don't have to raise your hand, like you've been in a holding pattern for a while. I think a lot of us have been in a holding pattern. And I think there was some breakthrough and there was something that happened, right? Back around September, October, and some people felt like this was it, this is it. This shift is coming, something's changing. But then there's just been this holding pattern that has gone on for all of these months. And you think, really, what? Imagine Joseph, he was in that prison and he interprets the dream and the guy says, you bet, I'll remember you. I would imagine the next day he's shaved and ready to go. But then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day. The holding pattern is the worst when you're flying. When I'm flying back from America, it happens all the time. I don't know what happens with you guys. It happens all the time. I need to not declare. It's going to be different from this point forward. But up to this moment, when I come back, inevitably, you're looking out the window at Heathrow. Yes, or London, or at least England. You're like, I want to be down there. And you can see, you know that screen? (laughs) And you just watch it go around and around and around and around. It's just this holding pattern. I'm like, ah, let me go. The worst thing you could do would be to leave. Sometimes the best thing to do is rest. Trust the pilot and remain in the holding pattern. But don't start believing that you'll never land. Because you're at until. I'm telling you, we're so close, guys. We are so close. Right at until. There's something about to shift and God is saying, please leave something here. Leave it here, because we're just at that point. Last scripture, Genesis chapter 45. This is when his brothers now realized who he was and felt maybe a little sheepish. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve 
life. His dream came true, but it looked different than it started. He understood the plan of God was not just about him, but about thousands of other people. Because it's never just about us. God always has a bigger picture. So I want to bring us very quickly into what does a new normal mean? In fact, if the worship band, could you come up? That'll give people hope. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to summarize some things. I've got so much, but I'm just going to summarize. In the purging, in the purging season, as his character was purged, his circumstance grew worse. And what was the new normal in this place? I believe the new normal was going from what I would call a facade to faith. Because in this place, in the purging, just feel free to start keys or whatever, whenever. In this place of the purging, sometimes we can put on a facade and we can call it faith. I don't have time to preach into all of that, but we can, we put it on because it's more, it protects us and it, it, it somehow protects us. I'm just going to keep saying this and keep saying this and I'm going to just keep saying this, but something here doesn't really believe it. And there's something about declaring, absolutely. But you know what, God, and this is just me. Maybe he had to teach me. Then why don't we take that facade off? Why don't you let me actually go a little bit deeper and show you that you don't really believe what you're saying? And why don't you let me get you to a point where you do believe it? So you can actually say it with faith. I don't like the, let's fake it till we make it. No, let's get to a point of believing. And let's strengthen that place of faith. And then let's stand. Everything looks different from that point. And I believe Joseph was a man of faith because he was a man who served when God had shown him that he himself would be the leader and people would bow down and serve him. Because you can't lead until you can serve. And maybe you've had this promise of leadership or promise of this or promise of that or I'm going to lay hands and see this and that and that's brilliant. I love that. But maybe God's saying, let's just move maybe a facade away. It's okay. He loves us so much. It's always done out of love. And I want to say, what do you really believe? And I had to be honest enough, someone who'd been Christian for nearly 30 years preaching around the world, Lord, I'm not sure that I really believe. I believe, but help my belief. And the Lord said to me, Jen, that's your problem. You're so focused on help my unbelief that you're not learning how to believe. I don't have time to go into that, but that's a new normal for somebody. Lord, teach me with faith to really actually believe. I feel like for someone it's taking that step again. You've done it. You've been hurt. You've come back. God, this terrifies me. But I want that. I really want it. For you, the new normal, I'm standing in a place of faith. Until I believe the new normal in this place is that we move from wanting to exit to a place of expectancy. This is right where we are. There are some people you're like, you know what? I am this close to giving up. I am this close to saying, forget this stuff. I'm this close to saying that never works. I am this close, Lord. I'm this close. 
when Joseph was in prison and he said, remember me, and he was forgotten for two more years, he could have been that close to saying, you know what, forget it. And we don't have time to read it, but what happened is when Pharaoh said, I need someone to interpret my dream, they came back to Joseph and it says he shaved and he prepared himself. Why? Because there was something of expectancy in him. This is it. This is it. I've been waiting years. I've been purged. I've been hurt. I've been done bad. I, people have hurt me. They've done things to me. I've been put in a place I shouldn't because of somebody else's decisions. But this is it. I'm expecting a breakthrough. And the reason he could expect it was because if you move into the new normal, if you go to that next place where dreams come true. In that place Joseph recognized it was not about him but it was about the plan of heaven. This is our new normal for what God is bringing in this next season. It is not about me. And with as much love in my heart and I really mean that it's not about you. It's about someone that needs what you're carrying. And that's why you had to go through the purging. Because as Tim said so brilliantly at the beginning, it's always all about Jesus. What does the scripture say about Jesus? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy, he had to go through a purging that none of us will ever experience or even come close to understanding. He was purged and he went through that until there was a breakthrough. And why did he do it? Because of the joy. And who is the joy? It's you. It's the thousands of people around the world. There is joy. Even Jesus, in a right way, said, it's actually not even about me. This is about my bride. So can't the bride say, no, Jesus, it's about you. Because isn't that love? I want to serve you. No, I want to serve you. No, I love you. No, I love you. For the joy, you're the joy. He endured. That dream, that promise, that thing that you've wanted, it's good. Make sure that that dream is hooked up with the heart of God. God's dream. Because it's far bigger than anything you could dream or even imagine because that's our God. Let's stand up. Let's just close our eyes in this place. I'm going to turn over to Tim in a minute, but I just felt so strong, like I said on the beginning, at the beginning, so strong on my heart that God has stitched us up for breakthrough this morning. He has stitched us up for breakthrough. He has stitched us up to say, do you want to be in a different place than where you are? Do you want to go through this purging different than you've seen it? Do you want to step into the dreams come true in a different mindset than what you've carried before? What do you want your new normal to look like? You need to prepare for it right now. How are you preparing for something new? How are you preparing for this? How are you preparing spiritually? I know that God has been moving and speaking and the Holy Spirit has put things on our hearts and he is saying different things to different people that you need to leave in the old season. You may still be in prison, so to speak, when you walk out, but you will be different and you will be prepared and you can be expectant because God's dream is going to come true. And we choose what we will be like when we step into that next season. And I wanna open, I wanna ask the prayer team to come forward And I want to open up the altars. And I want us to take a minute. And I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to plead with you. 
I want to say, do you want this or not? Do you want it? If you want it, I want you to come forward and just say, God, I want it. God, purge what you need to purge. Or maybe you're at that until and you said, Lord, my hand is on the door. It's right there. God, get everything ready for going into that next season. Just start coming. I know that there's people and that God is, he's moving. Your heart is beating and there's something stirring. And he's saying, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? If you want it, if you say, yes, God, I want that. Yes, I want that new season. In fact, let's just pray. And as I'm praying, I want you to be coming forward. Father, for those who say, yes, I want it. For those who have been in the prison, for those who have been accused of things that they did not do, for those who have seen things go from bad to worse, for those who have felt like they are in this holding pattern, for those who have not been able to see a breakthrough. God, I pray right now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would begin to minister, that you would begin to speak, that you would begin to remove the burdens. There are heavy burdens. I see knives in people's backs that have been placed there. That those knives be pulled out right now in the name of Jesus. I see words of accusation that have been spoken over you. And I declare a washing away of those words. A washing away of that accusation. And I ask right now God that you would open blind eyes and you would help them see who they are in Christ. That they would see their identity as a child of the living God. Father, I pray right now that royalty is released in this place that there is an understanding of royalty of who they are in Christ Jesus I declare that rags I see rags being dropped and royalty being picked up rags being dropped and royalty being picked up and Jesus I ask right now Lord by your presence by your presence Oh, I just see him just walking through the aisles, just walking amongst people. And I see him just laying hands on your shoulder. Just one touch, one touch, one touch, one touch. Just like the man at the pool of Bethesda. Do you want to get well? It's just one touch, sweetheart. It's just one touch. It's just one touch. Just say yes. Say yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Some of you, maybe you've never said yes to Jesus right now. Just under your, just say yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I want this. 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 Yes, Jesus. Ask him, say, come into my life right now. Just remove the old familiar and give me something new. Some of you, you've been in a dry season. I just see you so dry and he's pouring. He's pouring into you the water of life. The water of life abundantly. He has come that we would have life and have it more abundantly to the full until it overflows. And Father, I ask that for each one that's come forward, for those who maybe are in their seat and still know that they could be up here, Lord, minister to them as well. Your grace and your love and your peace. And Father, I just, one last thing I wanna do. If you have dropped something here, if you have left something, whether up front or at your seat, I want you just to open your hands to heaven. And God, I ask right now, you will begin to place something in their hands you would give them something in place of what they have dropped. For some, it's that royal robe. Give them something in place of what, some of them have dropped doubt. Some of them have dropped fear. Some have dropped unbelief. Some have dropped shame. Some of you have dropped pain that someone has spoken over you. Some of you have dropped, there's an unforgiveness in your heart. And as you release that, as you let it go, physically, you're going to begin to see a change in your own life and in your own heart. When you say, I forgive them, I let it go. I release, I just see the Lord giving you something in exchange for that, his peace, his healing, and his wholeness. Father, let there be a great exchange, a great exchange, a great exchange this morning.